Welcome. Welcome on this beautiful Sabbath morning in Charlotte, North Carolina. Welcome to our WGFY radio audience. Those of you that are watching on the internet from the United States and other nations, other countries, welcome to those of you that are here in person. You can listen anytime to the Prophecy Series as well as the sermons <clears throat> that come from our church by logging on to charlotteadventistchurch.com, sharonsdachurch.com. You can go to Facebook for Sharon SDA Church, or you can also go to YouTube, type in the sermon title or type in WGFY Radio, and there are just multiple ways that you can listen. We're very glad you're with us today, and before we begin, let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much that we still worship you in freedom. We know that that's going to end. I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit will fill our hearts and our minds as we study the important lessons that you have for us in Daniel. Surround us with your angels. Father, our goal is to live forever with you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Today is lesson three of 32 entitled Relevance of the Book of Daniel for Today. Conflict in life is inevitable. There's not much we can do about it as long as we're all dealing with multiple people every single day. In fact, conflict is one of the central themes of scripture, especially in the book of Daniel. You'll remember last week's lesson began with Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, besieging the city of Jerusalem. And from the world's point of view, <clears throat> seemingly victorious, it looked like the God of heaven had lost. And I'm sure there were people that lived in Jerusalem that died and who had family members that died who thought God had deserted them and God had lost, especially when the people were carried away captive to the city of Babylon. You can see from the map that I have on the screen, you'll see one red route, which was the route the Assyrians took 126 years earlier when they captured the 12 northern tribes and carried them captive to Persia, and beyond. The green route on the map shows the Babylonians' route for marching the captives from Jerusalem back to Babylon. It must have seemed to each captive as though God had forsaken them. If you were taken from your home today and possibly some of your family murdered and you were taken in chains to another country, would you feel God had forsaken you? I certainly think I might also. It must have been a terribly difficult journey. It's 900 miles straight across the desert from Jerusalem um, to Baghdad. So it, it was thousands of miles that the captives marched in sandals, by the way. They probably went the circuitous route that's about 1,500 miles to stay near the river um, so that <clears throat> they would have something to drink. When we say you're going to walk 1,500 miles, just to give it some perspective, that would be like walking from Charlotte to Bangor, Maine, or Charlotte to Dallas, Texas, or walking Charlotte to Lincoln, Nebraska. This is not a very easy thing. Yet, through all of this, being torn from their home, marched away as slaves, Daniel and his three companions never lost sight of the fact that God was in charge. You wonder when things happen to us in our lives, do we lose fact, uh, sight of the fact that God is in charge 
even though it's a bad thing happening to us. Daniel would have had every right to be bitter. He was placed in the palace of King Nebuchadnezzar, he and his three friends, and they were made eunuchs. Um, for those who don't understand the word eunuch, it means that an operation would have been performed on these young men in their early teens that had, would render them unable to have children or ever marry for that fact. This would have been a double whammy for someone who was taken captive as a slave and now endure an operation that would make them a eunuch. Furthermore, the worship pra practices of the Babylonians were totally against God. Many of these practices are still with us today. Sunday worship, for example. The worship of Ishtar. We pronounce it Ishtar. They pronounced it Easter. She was the goddess of fertility associated with bunnies and eggs. And Easter is still with us 6,000 years later, about 4,000 years later. Contrary to popular belief, the history of Easter does not represent the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In reality, it reflects the annual crossing of the sun through the vernal equinox known as spring. And the pagans thought that was when the sun was resurrected as the days became longer than the nighttime. This is an ancient practice that began with Nimrod in Babylon long, long before it was ever brought into the Christian church at the time of Constantine in three, the early 300s. They simply attached Jesus' resurrection to the celebration of the sun worship, and it's still with us today. Daniel and his friends truly had been captured and were led to leave the rest of their lives in the most wicked as well as the most famous as well as the most prosperous city on earth at that time. The events, the stories, the conflicts in the book of Daniel have a parallel to the things that are going to happen to you and me before Jesus comes. Studying the book of Daniel helps us realize how active Satan is in the world. We tend to forget Satan. If I asked you how many times you've thought of Satan the past week, probably none of you could name me maybe once something happened to you and you said maybe that's Satan. We forget him just exactly the way he wants us to. There are two issues over which controversy arises in the book of Daniel as well as the book of Revelation. They're the issue of worship, the issue of obedience. We're going to see these two issues illustrated very clearly in all the historical portions of Daniel and throughout Revelation. These same issues appear in the prophetic sections of Daniel, indicating they're going to be the major issues in the final conflict just before Jesus comes. Let's quickly look at five specific instances in the book of Daniel where the issues of worship and obedience demonstrate the controversy between Christ and Satan. First of all, in Daniel 1 verse 8, we read that the issue was a test of obedience to God's laws of health. The Bible specifically indicates in Leviticus 11 what foods are clean and unclean. Daniel refused to eat, he and his friends, the unclean food from the king's table. Number two, in Daniel 3, verse 10, we read about the issue of false worship. Nebuchadnezzar built a 90-foot-high image. History thinks of it himself 
demanded that every person in the kingdom bow down to this image and worship it when the music played. Now God's Ten Commandment law says, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. And we know the second commandment. And we also know that Daniel's three friends refused to bow down. And we know there were thousands of people on the plain of Dura that had been summoned to worship that golden statue. We all know that story. Governments may try to impose legislation that inhibits or prohibits the worship of God. A government may demand false worship. That is no excuse for us to disobey God. Only those who remain absolutely faithful, absolutely true to God will be ready, delivered when Jesus comes. Third, Daniel 4, verse 25. Nebuchadnezzar refused to worship God and give God the credit for the blessings that were poured out on Babylon after they captured the Jews. He refused to give God credit and he was punished with seven years of insanity. You'll remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar standing on the wall, looking out over the beautiful city of Babylon saying, look at Babylon, the city that I have built. Daniel 4 verse 30. And he was immediately stricken with seven years of insanity. And it's a good lesson for us. We should never believe that we achieve anything of our own intelligence, our own ingenuity, or our own power. You know, every gift we have, everything we achieve, is due to the blessing of God in our life. You know, I know people who have very large talents, talents that I wish I had, and they'll get angry in the church, and they'll refuse to sing or play or speak or do whatever God's calling them to do because somebody hurt their feelings. And I have said to some of these people, is that all it takes to keep you away from God? Because you see, if that's all it takes, the devil knows us. The devil knows if he can say one thing to you, Ariana, to keep you from singing. He knows the person who can do it. He'll put them in your path. Why wouldn't he? He's clever. He's smart. He'll do anything to keep us from serving God. Are we going to let him? You know, who's in charge of our lives? Daniel 5.23 is the issue of worship. You remember that in the middle of a drunken feast, Belshazzar had invited a thousand people plus all their ladies and friends and he had taken the chalices he knew were dedicated to God he knew the history of his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar and he said go get the sacred chalices from Jerusalem I'm going to show who's God around here and they brought the chalices to the feast in defiance of God and we know what happened. We know that in the middle of toasting their gods with wine from the chalices from the temple, a hand, fingers appeared on the dark wall and wrote, this night your life is ended. And that's the night that the Babylonian Empire fell to the Medes and Persians. In Daniel 6:11. We read of a government order signed by Nebuchadnezzar that no prayer could be given except to, to God or any gods. The only prayer that could be given was to uh, Nebuchadnezzar himself, knowing good and well that it was Daniel's, what he did every day. He prayed morning, noon, and night. And they knew that it would get Daniel in a snare and they cleverly played to the ego of King Nebuchadnezzar to have him sign the order so that they could put Daniel in the lion's den and be rid of him for the rest of their lives and we know how that turned out did Daniel waver when they came to put him in the lion's den no do we waver do we waver when God calls us to do something? We should not. 
prophecy is very clear powers especially of the little horn power will arise and attempt to prohibit true worship false worship will be sanctioned by law but we're going to learn from the book of Daniel that God will have a victorious people who will stand firm regardless of the law the controversy begins in the book of Daniel with the captivity of Daniel and his friends along with the first group 10,000 Jews there were several groups that came after that in this first chapter we'll study the story of how the young man and his friends faced a severe test which were inflicted by the king we'll also note the implications that these tests have for the rest of the book of Daniel the tests described in chapter 1 seem very mild in comparison to the tests that come later but the lesson in chapter 1 for us is that only those who pass the minor small test will ever pass God's major test how important then is it that you and I be faithful with the little test at all times okay let's review Nebuchadnezzar's siege of Jerusalem in Daniel 1 1 what does it mean that the Babylonian army lays siege to Jerusalem the city of God in ancient times nations came and surrounded a walled city and they simply stayed there until everybody inside starved to death their water dried up the inhabitants gave up it was a terrible ordeal for God's people living in Jerusalem in 587 BC for 30 months so well over a year Nebuchadnezzar broke through the walls finally captured the people pillaged and stole burned down the temple carried away the wealth and the riches of Jerusalem the gold the silver the vessels that had been around since Moses in the wilderness crafted actually by Moses workmen in the wilderness and read about it in Exodus 25 when you have time about the sanctuary and how it was built all of these items were taken from the temple at that time and carried back to Babylon let me pause to say that when Babylon fell 70 years later the Persian King Cyrus the Great who ruled from 559 to 530 BC liberated the Jews and let them go back and rebuild Jerusalem and the walls and the temple and he gave them back all the things from the temple that the Babylonians had stolen and brought with them when Rome conquered Jerusalem in 70 AD the Roman Empire also burned down the temple and took all the sacred vessels back to Rome and they are reportedly still there still in the Vatican vaults to this day note on the screen the picture of the soldiers carrying the implements from inside the temple back to Rome you'll see the table of shoe bread on your right you'll see the seven branch golden candlestick and other items they are still in Rome as the COVID-19 crisis worsened worldwide in January 2 2022 the nation of Israel requested that the Vatican immediately return to Jerusalem these sacred vessels that have been there for over 2,000 years many requests August 9 2015 to Pope Francis what do you believe are the odds that they will ever be returned it's my personal opinion zero to none are the odds that they'll ever be returned they did not get the Ark of the Covenant why do you remember why before the temple was destroyed God made known to Jeremiah and a few faithful servants what was going to happen to the temple and he told them to take the ark you cover it the men carry it on the poles they took it somewhere 
way beyond Jerusalem and secreted it, secreted it in a cave. And it is in that cave to this day. Will somebody find the ark before Jesus comes? I don't have any clue. But it is still hidden. It has never been disturbed since it was secreted. And you can look that up in the story of redemption, page 195, if you're interested in reading about it. Was it by Nebuchadnezzar's power that Jerusalem fell? Daniel 1, verse 2, no. The Bible says, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with the articles from the temple of God. So it makes sense that God was in charge of everything. They carried everything away to Babylon, but then the next power gave them back to come back and rebuild the temple. Nothing happens. You know, as we come up to all that's going on politically, as we listen to this, uh, frankly, I quit watching the news. I didn't turn it on. It, you, you can watch the news once a week and be up to date because they keep saying the same thing over and over and over, day in and day out. Nothing happens to any nation, to any people, to any country without God permitting it. He is sovereign over all. Individuals have free choice, but God will arrange the fate of nations, and he's working out his plan of salvation for the world, and the world is going to end, not because I say so, because the word of God says so. So when we get all hepped up and excited over what's going to happen to this political figure or that political figure, you may as well back off. You may as well just be quiet. Because God's got it covered. So why did God allow Judah to be taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar? Why? Jeremiah 2, 11, 13 told them it was going to happen. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? You see, Israel has forsaken God. They're going after idols again, I might add. They have forsaken me the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Through the prophet Jeremiah and other Bible prophets, God predicted the warfare of the Babylonians against Judah because they had turned their backs on God, ceased to worship God, disobedient to his word and the word of his prophets. It was a lack of worship, a lack of obedience to God that led to Israel's captivity even though it appears to human minds that Israel was defeated and the gods of Babylon had triumphed over the God of Judah. The book of Daniel makes it clear as we study that evil may appear to prosper, but God's truth will always triumph in the end because the devil is a defeated enemy and God always wins. We need to be careful whose side we're on. What kind of young people did Nebuchadnezzar choose from the captives of Judea? He wanted a group that would receive education. And at that time, it was the best education in the world. Daniel 1, 3, and 4 and, and uh, give you some answers to this. Four parts of it. Nebuchadnezzar chose captives from the king's seed. What does that mean? He wanted the slaves to be the royalty of Judea, the royal children of Judah. But they also had to be children in whom there was no blemish. He wanted them perfect because he intended them to become his palace elites. Nebuchadnezzar also wanted them to be well-favored, skillful in wisdom, cunning in knowledge. In other words, they had to be smart, they had to be pretty, very attractive, and they had to be straight-A students. You know, they were going to learn several languages, astrology, astronomy, boohoos of mathematics. They had to be gifted 
and talented. The Babylonian math is still with us. They were very, very smart people. Our math today is a base 10, probably because we have 10 fingers and 10 toes, I'm not sure. The Babylonians created the base 6, and that base 6 is still with us. We still have 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute. That was created by the Babylonians. They're the ones that figured out the magic square of the gods that adds up to the number 666, in, which is their sun god. They gave all their gods a number and then put it all in this magic square. And if you add up their gods horizontally or vertically or diagonally, each line, six lines, adds up to 111. Times six is 666. It's the worship of the sun god. It's the apostasy. 666 is the apostasy against the God of heaven. He wanted them to have an understanding of science. This would have been a knowledge of plants and animals. And these young people from Judea would have been skilled in these studies. Clearly, Nebuchadnezzar chose from the very best of the lot that he captured. Their education would last three years now. They were probably 13 or 14 uh, when they were captured. Any older, and the Babylonians would not have used them, would not have brought them in to train them to work in the palace. Because if you're much beyond 12 or 13, you're not going to learn brand new languages and everything that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had in mind. Out of all the youth of Judah who entered into this education, only four are named in the biblical record, Daniel 1.6. Hananiah, Dan Daniel, Mishael, and Azariah. We don't know why only four are named, except they stand out for their worship of God. Maybe all the others were cooperative with the Babylonians and were easily assimilated into their culture and practices. We don't know. All we know is of all the thousands and thousands that were captured, only four are mentioned in the Bible. Babylonian names were given to these four youth, Daniel 1.7. That's an attempt to make them completely forget their past lives. They were to be totally indoctrinated into Babylonian culture and their gods. Hananiah, Shadrach meant inspired by the god Aku, A-K-U, if I'm saying it right. Daniel was given the name Belteshazzar, meaning the god Bel will protect him. Mishael was given Meshach, meaning belonging to the god A-K-U. Azariah was given the name Abednego, meaning servant of the god N-E-G-O, Nego. The new names were to certify and guarantee to everybody their loyalty to the gods of the Babylonians. The Hebrew name Daniel means God is my judge. But these four men, regardless of their indoctrination, stand out in history because they could not be shaken from their faith, their knowledge that they had gained in Jerusalem from their parents and the living God of the universe. It's a biblical fact that in both the Old and New Testament, the word translated test means to be proven by trial. So when God tests his children, his purpose is to reveal that our faith is genuine, that no matter what happens to us, we will be faithful to God. And let me make something very, very clear. No trial is put on us because God is going to get us. Satan is here every day to do whatever it takes to break our spirit and make us turn our backs on God. That's his specialty. That's what he wants. He doesn't, God doesn't test us for himself. God doesn't need to test us. He knows our thoughts. But he is proving to us and those around us 
that our faith is genuine and that no trial Satan can put on us will cause our faith to falter. We will be true even to death. Our faith will show that no matter what Satan does, he cannot overcome us because we belong to God. When you're going through something hard, you wonder where God is. Remember, the teacher is always silent during a test. Look at trials at, uh, as opportunities to be a witness for God. Even if your heart is broken, even if you feel like your life is over, trust God. Our faith falters often. And one of the big ways our faith falters that some of you don't even know yet is through our children. Because if God, if Satan can hurt a mom or a dad, the easiest way to do it is through your children. Are we going to let that keep us from God? No. No matter what happens to us, let's vow that we will trust God. Our testing results in spiritual maturity. It results in completeness in, completeness in Christ. James 1, 2 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Have you considered your trials pure joy? Lately, Sierra has been having a terrible time with pain, just not even sleeping. She, I don't think she says she hasn't slept in days. Have you said, this is a joy? Thank God for my trials. You don't thank God for trials, do you? No. You know, in testing our faith, God causes us to grow into strong disciples who truly do live by faith, not what we see, not feeling good, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. The testing of Daniel and his three friends were simple tests. They were tests of diet. They were no sooner selected to be groomed by Nebuchadnezzar's servants till they're faced with the test of diet. Daniel 1, 5 tells us what the diet for those specially selected to eat at the king's table was. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. In other words, they're going to eat the very same thing that's fixed for the king to eat. They're to be trained for three years, and after that, they're to enter the king's service. What could be better? You wind up as a slave in another country, you're in the palace, you got great clothes, you're eating at the king's table, same food being served to the richest king in the world. The problem was all the king's table served unclean meat and fermented wine. So the first test would be, are you going to rationalize and indulge, or are you going to stand up somehow, some way, you're just a kid, remember, they're 13 or 14, and Daniel and his friends refused to eat unclean meat or drink the intoxicating beverages. They would not disobey God. You know, to me, they really had to have a strong backbone to be that young. We know Proverbs 23, 31. We're all familiar with it. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Most of us recognize that the greatest problem with alcohol is it loosens our inhibitions and our thought processes. People say and do things that they would never say and do if they were sober. And we all know that. All the repentance in the world, and God certainly does forgive us, but it will not alter consequences of intoxicated words or drunken actions. There are thousands of alcohol-related deaths every year in the United States. You can ask God to forgive you, but it will not bring back the dead body from the car crash. All simply unnecessary had alcohol been avoided. Now, we aren't told exactly what food was on the king's table, 
But there were several reasons why a godly Jew would avoid eating the royal food. First of all, they were a pagan nation eating unclean food. And even if the food had been clean, clean meat according to Leviticus 11, it would not have been prepared kosher. In other words, the blood would not have been drained out of it. A portion of the meat also was offered as a sacrifice to pagan gods, Acts 15, 29. So if Daniel and his friends are going to eat from the king's table, it would have been hard to find something to eat there unless there were some fruits and nuts and vegetables not cooked in pork. It was luxurious, it was rich, and it simply wasn't what these young men thought they could eat. And there was nothing to drink except water other than something that was unclean to them. Daniel and his friends wanted to avoid it altogether because they were trained, they knew that it would interfere with their physical, mental, and spiritual development. Now, how would you be 14, 13, 14 years old, your parents, no mention of their parents, maybe their parents were killed in the siege of Jerusalem, we're not told. What a dilemma for these young people. They're being treated like royalty. Shouldn't they have been grateful? Hey, I'm not dead. I've, I've, I've got a fairly good life with this horrible thing that's happened to my nation. But to eat would mean disobedience to Scripture. To refuse to eat the meats and the rich, rich foods it, it, it would be standing for God. They could not disobey God. Let me ask you, let me ask myself, when we come to temptations each day, do we say to ourselves, I cannot do that and disobey God? Daniel 1.8, we're told Daniel purposed in his heart he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Loyalty to God was more important than eating to Daniel. So here we see the beginning of the issue that's going to be illustrated again and again in the book of Daniel, God's faithful people being brought into conflict and the issue, a choice between obedience to God and obedience to man. This issue came up in the New Testament too. In Acts 5.29, Peter and the other apostles said, we should obey God rather than man. Like Daniel, God's people in the end time will not hesitate to choose obedience to God over obedience to man. At the end of my presentation, I'm going to show you something that's just recently happened that does affect all of you. Daniel 1.8 is a key verse in the book of Daniel. It vividly portrays why God could trust Daniel so implicitly throughout his life. So Daniel and his friends came up with a plan. They're under the leadership and training of the prince of eunuchs of the palace. So Daniel asks him, how about letting us eat vegetables and water, nothing else? This is, this is bold, a bold request. These are, these are kids. These are young people that the palace guard could say, no way, eat what's on the table and and shut up, basically. Nebuchadnezzar, by the way, came to the throne during the siege of Jerusalem. Let's back up a second. His dad died. When Remember I told you there are 30 months surrounding Jerusalem before Jerusalem gave in and they were able to take the city? During that 30 months, Nebuchadnezzar's father died. He hot-footed it across the desert, got the crown, he's the new king, and came back to finish up the siege. He would have been in his early 20s. So when we think of King Nebuchadnezzar and his relationship with Daniel, we're not talking Daniel's probably 13 or 14 and the king is 50 or 60. We're talking Daniel's a young man, but so is King Nebuchadnezzar. He came to the throne and he would have learned from his father that nobody contradicts the king. And you contradict Nebuchadnezzar, you die. That's how the land was ruled. 
But God is always at work in the background of our lives, no matter what happens to us. This is why we can be fearless. Daniel 1.9 tells us that God had brought Daniel into favor and into tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. But regardless of how much the prince liked Daniel and his friends, Daniel 1 verse 10 tells us, he said, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king then would then have my head because of you. The prince of the eunuchs was scared to grant their request. So Daniel proposed a test. Give us 10 days, let us eat vegetables and water, and then let's let King Nebuchadnezzar test us. And when he did, when King Nebuchadnezzar tested them, they were found to be 10 times superior in every single test Nebuchadnezzar could think of to give them. They were 10 times better in mental, mentally and vigor and literary attainment. They stood unrivaled. And I'm sure he tested them from astrology to the sciences, everything he could think of. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 485, will give you the story. Testing comes to each of us, comes to each of us every day. It is especially gearing up to a one world religion. This is something I want to discuss with you today. We brought this up Tuesday night in my Bible study class. Pope Francis in 2019, and I talked about it to you in 2019, announced the coming of a one world religion. At that time, and I remember telling you this, I have it on a slide, the Pope met with the Islam and signed a contract to build headquarters in Dubai and it was to be the root, the start, the goal of a one world religion. I want to show you today that all those plans and all the multiple billions of dollars, the headquarters for the one world religion is now finished and the Pope is pleading openly writing speaking almost every time you hear him speak for a one world religion General Kelly speaking in Texas two years ago said publicly that we cannot be one nation under God unless we are one religion under God. And that's the thought of many, many people in today's world. This one world religion will be called Chrislam. The push is to merge all existing religions in order to establish a single global religion. How many of you knew this? You're aware that it was built? Any? Anybody aware of this? A couple of you? You have to really watch. And I search the internet each couple times a week for what the latest thing is they're doing. Now here I'm showing you a picture of the Chrislam complex that's seen as the center of a religious future together. Pope Francis writes and I quote, that God wants a fraternity among Muslims, Catholics, Jews, and everyone else in the world. Everyone is to live in religious harmony with nobody trying to convert anybody else. We're all going to live together happily ever after. Have you forgotten the Inquisition? For years, prophecy has predicted a coming one world order 
a coming one world religion. I'm telling you this morning, it is here. I'm old. I've been hearing it all of my life. I am watching it happen now. It's, it's here. The foundation is solidly in place. And we see this prophecy unfold before our very eyes. You know, the Church of Rome might call the shots, but Islam will provide the muscle with their tens of millions of jihad warriors. Do I believe there'll be martyrs going forth as Chrislam begins to um, advertise and promote and take over? Probably. What will we do? Will we go along to get along? Or will we stand for God and what we know to be the truth of God's word? If ever there were a people that knows the Bible, it's you. It's me. We were cut our teeth. Most of us could say the Ten Commandments by the first grade. What will happen to us when we come to the same testing of Daniel and his friends? Because it definitely is coming. If you would like to read this for yourself, if you have any doubts about what I'm telling you, Google. Take a picture of on the screen, get your phone out, and Google it. Don't take my word for anything. Study for yourselves. This is a stunning new multi-faith complex. The mosque, the synagogue, the church. Watch the video. The Pope's one world religion takes form. Go home and watch it. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to yourself not to believe me. You owe it to yourself to study for yourself. This is not going to happen. This is happening, and it is only the iceberg. Agenda 21, which I've talked to you about, the 17 goals of sustainable development, one of them is a one-world bank. Do you see that coming to fruition? Have you studied it? It's happening. One-world currency, one-world bank, one-world Law, all laws, the same in every nation. One world, everybody, nobody owns property. That's the goal. The goal is no borders. No nation will have borders. That's one of the sustainable goals. No one will individually own property. That's one of the sustainable goals. Look it up. Understand, folks, where we are in history. You know the image of Daniel 2? We're going to study that in, an, in the next lesson. Where you get down to the toes of the image. You all familiar with that? I want to tell you, we're living in the toenails of the image. We are here at the very end. Please look up what is on the screen. Google it. Listen to it. We're living in the very last days. Let's study carefully the book of Daniel in the coming weeks. Let's learn that in the midst of great turmoil, our God reigns. He is supreme. We can have faith and absolute trust in him. We do not have to fear the future. Why? Because we know who we are. We are the royal children of the God of the universe. Satan can't touch us. Okay, maybe he can take somebody's life. That doesn't touch us. His life is brief. We're going to learn as we study Daniel that God is always in control. You know, we think we control, th we, we control nothing. We will learn that God is always in control. Never doubt it. God is on our side. We only will get in trouble if we forget who we belong to. And we have a tendency to do that. Let's not. Let's not. We are God's royal children. Let's act like 
we're royalty. Let's act like he is the God who can do anything. Every breath we take, every heartbeat comes from him. Give ourselves to him and let him have his way. Tell you what, I'm happy to see it happen. I want Jesus to come. Don't you? Let's get it over with. Why are we here? Let's go home. Will you bow your heads with me in prayer? Oh, Father, I want you to come. It's gone on. The world is horrible. It's turned its back on you. Father, help us as your children. You have called us. You called us before we ever knew you. And, and you've claimed us as yours. Help us, Lord, to abide under your wing, in your faith. Help us, Father, to never for one moment forget who we belong to and who is the most powerful being in the universe, that you are our Father, our God, our Lord, our Savior. I lift up Pastor Brian before your throne. Be with him today, Lord, as he speaks to us. Be with us, Father, as we bow before you in the communion service. Let our hearts, let our minds be controlled by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone.